Just turn our attention to him and sing it again.
on Jesus right now. I feel like I've said this for a long time on and off, but he's giving tunnel vision right now that we can only see him in this moment. So let's just go after it. There is no one like him. All distraction falls to the side, all chaos, anything that's not of him right now. And let's just focus on who he is and proclaim that right now. And there is no one like our God. We will pray. Come on, sing it out. You, there's no we will, there is no one like, oh, come on, we will.
shout your name. Oh, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. And Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Because we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. That's why we're singing. It's why we're dancing. It's why we shout. Cause we love you, Jesus. 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 It's all about 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 you, Jesus. Jesus. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like you. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like you, God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like you. Come on, sing it right to him. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like you, God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like you, God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like you, God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no Just lift up your voices to him. Give him all of you this morning. Shout to the Lord again. Come on, just lift up your voice. 
because you're good, just because you're good, just because you're good, not because we want anything out of you, just because you're good, just because you're good, just because you're good. Be lifted up, be lifted up, be lifted higher and higher. Be lifted up, be lifted up, be lifted up, be lifted up. You're just good, you're just good, you're only good. Be lifted up, be lifted up. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher. Higher, so let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You're worthy, so let your name. Activate your mouth. Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come on. Lift his name up. Lift his name up. Thank you, Lord. It's in this place we're going to do communion. If we can get that set up, the communion set up, um, we're, it's, it's, in this, um, it's in the place. Just before Josh came up to, to say that we need to acclaim his name, I was going to do the same thing. I felt in my heart that it's the name above every name. So whatever name we put on something, we put a name on cancer, we put a name on... On, on racism, we put a name on division, spirit of chaos, we put our name on, on, on um, I don't know, prodigal, whatever we want to name, he is the name above every name. He's the name above every name, and we want to name that. I, I don't want us to, to, to disappear from our worship here and go into communion mode, because I think we do. Sometimes we shift. I want us to stay in this declaration, this place of declaring his name, because the communion... As, as we set this up here in a moment, we, we, we are setting up the bread and the cup are being set up that represent who? Jesus. And everything he's done is in his name, is found in the, in the representation in the bread and the juice. It's represented the finished work of Jesus and his name, the power of his name. Is, is released. So I want us right to, to declare that name over. What, what's the issue you have? What do you got that you have to declare the name over? Some of us, some of us is addictions. It's, 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 it's inner things. It's, it's some of the things we have inside of us. Some of it might be anger or fear. Declare the name of Jesus over it. Some of it is it's a burden we have over our family. We've got prodigal kids. We've got, we've got situations. We've got needs. We've, we have provisional needs. We're looking at, at, a, at a problem, whatever it may be. Others, we look at our nation. It's the name of Jesus. He's the answer for the division and the separation and those things. He's the name above every name. And so I want us to declare that. I want us to, to take a couple more minutes here and just say, Jesus, you are above cancer. Jesus, you are above racism. Jesus, you are above the brokenness that we see all around us. 
You are the name that is above every name. Come on, let's declare it right now. Put some energy into it. If it means you got to stand up or do whatever, do that. Let's let's march around. Let's just declare the name above every name. The name above every name. The name above every name is Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus, you're greater. You're greater than coronavirus. You're greater than than uh, than cancer. You're greater than the fear that's on our that's on the school system as it begins to to reconvene. We speak the name of Jesus over education. We speak the name of Jesus over our families, over protocols. We speak the name of Jesus over the, the divisions in our land, the, the racisms and the, 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 um, the divisions, all the isms, schisms, the things that have separated us, denominationalism. We break its power in Jesus' name. We speak the name of Jesus over every family, over every relationship. We speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. You're the one who breaks it all down. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. I speak Jesus over every marriage, every family represented here. Speak the name of Jesus over every relationship. We speak the name of Jesus over our children, our grandchildren. We speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over over our neighborhoods, over our family, over over our government. We speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over the economy. We speak the name of Jesus over the needs that are represented here and beyond. We speak the name of Jesus over this nation, that this nation will rise to its purposes again, that God will use this nation as a place of evangelism to touch the world in the name of Jesus. We call it forth. We call it forth. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. You're the one who covers us. You're the one who keeps us. You are, you are. You are peace. You are joy. You are life. You are righteousness. You are hope. Oh, yes. Come on, come on, lift him up. Yes. Yes. Let your name be lifted higher. 
can. Just start speaking it out. Come on. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just, I just really received a word from the Lord in this moment that what we're doing right now is really powerful. First Corinthians chapter 11. When Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, he says this, Raj, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you declare the Lord's death until he comes. Here's what the Lord said to me. All we have to do is eat the bread and we declare to the powers of darkness, you're on the clock, your time is up. All we have to do is drink that little cup and you are declaring over everything in your life that is dark and evil and against the kingdom of God, you're on the clock. Your time is up. All we have to do is eat that little piece of bread and drink that little cup and we are declaring over hell the death, the finished work of Jesus. That's all it takes is a little bread and a little wine and we have de and we have an active power greater than all the combined power of hell. That's what we're doing in these moments. That's what you're doing in these moments. Eat the bread, drink the cup and declare it's done in Jesus name. I think that works for us. We'll open it up. We'll open up communion. Just come as you do. Let's declare it. Eat and drink and declare it. Declare the, the death of Jesus the, and the life that God has given to us over every circumstance. Thank you, Lord.
Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
Jesus. Oh, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for you, Jesus. Oh, I'm so thankful. Oh, I'm so thankful. Oh, I'm so thankful for you, Jesus. Cause Jesus paid it all and all to him I and sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. conquers every enemy. It's perfect love that stands against every storm. And at the root of everything, I'm, all I've heard this morning, all through the worship, is that God has a moment right here. And he says he wants to release a furious love. His furious love over you that penetrates your spirit and your heart in such a way that it will compel everything that you do. It will compel you to go out. It will compel you to share the gospel. It will compare you. It will compel you to intercede. It will be the compelling factor that just has to burst out. And I just, I kept hearing him say that. And so I just want to release what he's saying. He wants to release over you. And I release that over the body this morning. A furious love. I experienced a tad bit of this when I went to Dominican Republic recently. And I was praying over this lady in the marketplace. And as I was weeping over her, I felt just a fraction of this fury, fiery love that I'd never experienced before. It wasn't just compassion. It was furious. And that's what he has for you. And that's what he has to release out of you as the body. And that is what is going to conquer chaos. That is what's going to instill and calm people. That is what's going to release his peace. Everything that he does, his bloodshed, his laying down his life, his broken body, Everything that he did, everything that he was, everything that he is, is out of that furious love. So, Father, I just, in obedience, I just, I release it over us today. I release it into our hearts and in our spirit, and then let it be experiential, God. Your furious, fiery love released over this body today. Your fiery, fiery fiery love that we never experienced before. A fresh release of it, God. A baptism of it, as it were. A baptism of your fiery love be released right now over us and in us. And let us be so changed by it that it compels us in every area of our life in prayer in moving and living and speaking and doing and prophesying all of it, God, based out of your fiery love. Spirit, do your work. Spirit, do your work. In the inside of us, 
let us be permanently changed, permanently captured, permanently captured, bond slaves of it, permanently captured by it. Just release that wraparound love over every everyone that's here today, Lord. Just a renewal of your love and grace. Affirming, affirming your love, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Release that love. Let us know that love. Let us know that love that surpasses knowledge. Let us experience a love that we can't explain. God, bring us into that place. Let it be released over here. Over us, God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As we're calling on the name of Jesus and eating, declaring his name over every issue and problem, we get a text that Kathy Bennett is, uh, is being admitted in the hospital. Um, so I want us to pray for her right this moment. Uh, you know, she's been fighting a number of things through the years and then recently was diagnosed with... Uh, uh, leukemia and so just she testified to that a few weeks back and then um, the enemy would love to uh, to to destroy we have the name of Jesus so we speak it over Kathy right now in Jesus name we speak it over her Lord we curse we curse the death Lord we curse the enemy who would try to steal life we rebuke Lord we stand against it in the name of Jesus. I stand against it and I speak life over her, the life of God. The name of Jesus is a name above leukemia, and we speak it forth in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. There's power in your name, Lord. Let it permeate her cells. Let it touch her blood. Lord, may it touch, Lord, her bone, her marrow in the name of Jesus, that your word would penetrate. And Lord God, bring forth your purposes in her life. We call it forth in Jesus' name. We thank you. You will do it. You are doing it. And we are expecting much in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. We eat. All we have to do is eat and drink. All we have to do, and it proclaims, it declares the Lord's death. Thank you, Lord. What you've accomplished on the cross has been done over her body in Jesus' name. Thank you for it, God. Thank you, Lord. I'm also going to pray for Bree today. She is leaving. Out of a billion people that applied, she got selected for a special program and is going to California. Um, maybe not a billion, but... So uh, come, come down here. We want to pray for you. Um, she also has a need, and I'm just going to put this out here. She's got a need. Uh, her vehicle needs some help. And um, there's some finances that go with that and getting it repaired. If the Lord, I'm just going to say that if the Lord moves on your heart and you would say something that you can maybe help her, um, that would be wonderful just after service or see her or see me and we'll, uh, we'll make that happen. But um, she's, she's headed out to uh, California, of all places. That's far from here. So she needs the Lord's presence, his go with her, go before her. To help her get adjusted, but um, we know God's hand is on her life, and let's just declare his purposes. I'd like some of our ladies just to come gather around, and everybody else stretch a hand this way, and let's, um, and let's, just, um, let's just speak a blessing over her, speak life over her. Go ahead. Just speak blessings over her. 
We bless her right now in Jesus' name. Speak your blessings over her. Bless her. Provide for her. Go ahead of her, Lord. Protect her. Keep her. Let your purposes be fulfilled in her, God. That nothing, no weapon forged against her will prevail. You go before her. You'll be a dad to her. You'll be a, a friend. You'll be a husband in, a, in the sense of a covering and a protector. Let her understand, Lord, that you are close to her, keeping her. And Lord, we lift Bree up to you, Lord. We just, we, Lord, we, 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 Lord, release her to your purposes, God. May you be glorified and magnified in and through her. Go before her, God. Meet her every need, Lord, as she goes. May you protect her. May you keep her. May she sense your presence and your favor on her life. And Lord, I pray that you would, you, Lord, you would use her in a powerful way, Lord God. That her purpose, the purpose that you created her for, Lord, would be fulfilled on the earth. That she would be an influencer of men and women, God. And you would raise her up for your glory. That she would influence many, Lord, with the gospel. And that, Lord, your kingdom would advance through her, God. We thank you for that. We thank you for the calling that's on her life. And we thank you that you are going to, Lord, use her in a powerful way, Lord God, to touch others. You're going to communicate through her. You're going to release your kingdom. You're going to, to, to scream Jesus through her life to a dying world. And we thank you for that. You are doing that, and we just are believing for more and more. Bless her, we pray. Pour your spirit out upon her, Lord, and let your wraparound love be in, on her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just a couple things. Uh, this week, uh, we continue our uh, Wednesday night um, discipleship intensive. It's, it's, it's good. This first week was good. This week got better. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's just going to be increasing as we just are broadening out our, if you haven't been coming, you'd like to come, you're still welcome. We're broadening out our uh, foundation. We want to make it strong and make it solid. Years back, year, years back, early 80s um, in Cocoa Beach, there was a terrible accident. Um, they were pouring the uh, fourth or fifth floor of a condo in Cocoa Beach. And um, some of you might remember this. And as they were pouring the wet cement on that floor, the entire building collapsed with workers inside, people were killed. When they went back, as the investigation came, they found out that to save money, they were cutting the cement quality to save money. So not, the engineers called for a certain, certain grade, and they had cut the grade. And, and so you can imagine the lawsuits, the various things that have happened, the loss of life as a result. It was, uh, it was a very, very tragic thing. In fact, it, it's so tragic, it, was, it actually affected the building coding in, in Florida to this day. It was a major shifting that took place in that time. But God forbid that as God wanted to pour the fifth floor of his glory on your life, yeah. that your first four floor couldn't hold the weight because you cut corners to get to where you are. God wants us to, God, we can't cut the corners. Our foundation has to be sure and has to be, has to be solid or it will collapse. And so we want greater glory. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do is just go deeper with that. And that's what we're doing. Next week, um, not Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, next week, Monday the 31st, Tuesday the 1st, Todd Smith will be with us. 6.30 we're starting. Um, we're starting the worship. If you can't get here that early, we're starting it early because it's going to be late nights. That's just, we, so, so um, instead of us, so we're starting a little early so that we can kind of do the worship and get that. So if you can be here, uh, you want to come a little early. I'm expecting crowds. We're getting phone calls and people from around the state. Todd has been actually 
um, propagating it through his, his uh, network too. So there's people that are, that are coming in. In fact, someone we don't even know, they wrote on the bottom on the Facebook page, they just wrote, revival is coming to Titusville. Do not miss getting in the fire. So, so uh, we, we, are, we had a word this morning. Rosemary gave me a word this morning about fire. Todd's whole thing was that God showed him fire on the, on the baptism waters. And so we will have baptism. We're trying to figure out how we're going to do it inside, outside, what's going to happen. But we will be doing baptisms. And he'll talk about it, but he saw fire on the top of the baptism waters. And and so they've been baptizing people into the fire. In fact, um, Bob and Steve were up there last weekend. Um, They drove all the way to Georgia for the weekend just to get get ahead of us. And they came back. They were staggering around here Wednesday night telling me about the glory of God and what happened and how God worked. And, and so, is it worth it being in those meetings? Yes. Okay, good. So, uh, so that'll, be, that'll be next week. And also, the, the, a school of ministry is starting up on, on September 7th, Monday night. There's been some questions regarding it because school of ministry goes Monday, Thursday. Until we finish the intensive, school of ministry will be Monday, Wednesday. Monday, Wednesday, and then the second week in October, when we stop the eight weeks, then it'll go Monday, Thursday. So don't think you have to, you're tripling, you've got three nights out that, whatever. We're trying our very best to not make you too busy, because busyness will kill a move of God. And it'll kill a move of God personally in the busyness of the pursuit of the move of God. And so we want to keep a balance there. So if you're interested in signing up for School of Ministry, there's a sign-up sheet outside in the, in the lobby, and uh, just put your name on there and the information because it will it'll wreck your life. It'll change you and empower you, and you'll be used in a... I just believe God's going to... He's doing a great work. And so we were expecting... We were away, uh, not away, but we got to be down in the meetings in Satellite Beach um, this past week. Some of you, many of us were, some of you were here, there. But um, Jane Hammond spoke on Thursday night about chaos, that a spirit of chaos has been released over the, over the nation, but that God was going to make K, turn chaos and bring change to the people of God, and that's what's happening, and I was very good. And then, and then Dutch Sheets on Friday night spoke, and he, he's just talking about, but one of the things I picked up that was very strong is, is that the purposes of God for this nation are going to be fulfilled. They are going to be fulfilled. There's a, the, the, the reason there's such a fight is because God wants to push the reset button and bring this nation back to what it was founded on so that the world, because as this nation goes, so goes the world. It's just true. And so if, 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 God, if this nation can be reset, the foundations be reset on the purposes and plan of God to release kingdom through this nation, it will affect the nations of the earth. It's not a proud, arrogant thing. It's just really the truth. Everywhere I've gone in the world, they, the, our economy affects them, what we happens here. They watch us so much politically, everything, because whatever happens here affects the world all around, all over the world. And so, so we want to call this nation, and God is bringing this nation back to his purposes. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? And look at your neighbor and say, and you are a big part of that. Phew! Wow. Thank you, Lord. So our ushers are going to come. We're just going to uh, be, be blessed as you give. May, you be glor- may the Lord be glorified. May he take what is given, break it, multiply it, and reach the nations through all that's happening here. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You can come and bring your offering. Thank you, Lord. 
I had a lot of different, many people say something to me about the message last week. I got to tell you that I, that I remember I stole it, okay? I did have my own twist on it, but I did steal it. But, 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 I, but one of the things that, um, that there was a comment, Hector sent me a, a this is, I'm just going to go to, this is the beginning of my message, okay? So my introduction. So Hector sends me a text and he said, because I said something about not understanding why Elijah laid on top of the young boy. And so, so I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 4, I'm, I'm sorry, to 2 Kings chapter 4, and we're going to pick up there because Hector said, could it be that, the, that he laid on him because of the weight of glory and that the glory of the Lord upon that boy raised him from the dead? Something along those lines, he texted me. And, and so I, that, got me, that got me thinking, because as soon as he said that, I thought two things happened. Not only did he, did he put the weight on him, if that was glory, but he also had a face-to-face -face encounter. So the glory of the Lord and the face-to-face -face that the boy was brought in. That's where I want to begin, because uh, the Lord has been, uh, I, as I roll over, I, I have, I, um, I, we started sometimes... Uh, I, um, I, five or six days a week, I, I do workout. I work out, but I, I can't just, they're not very long, but sometimes they're intense. And um, Danae tries to whip me into shape. And, and that whip sometimes has, it's like a cat of nine tails. It's got little spikes and everything in it. And so, um, so sometimes the workouts include like, we do a lot of core work. And some are including like burpees, super burpees, extreme burpees. If you don't know what a burpee is, just look it up. A regular burpee will kill you. A super burpee will kill the person watching you. An extreme super burpee kills everybody in the room. And so we switched to this new workout we're doing, and in that workout, there's a lot of upper body in here work, muscles here, okay, just in here. And because of it, I, I haven't been sleeping solid. I'm just gonna tell you, okay, I tossed and turned because my arms have been going to sleep from overuse in doing this, okay? Not a problem. It's turned into a good thing because because I've been restless, the Lord's been speaking to me in the night. So it's just been a process. And so I, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about what I hear the Lord saying and what he's been saying to me in the night. And it all stri strings off of Hector's text, this text, and then where we're going to go. So, so hopefully this will all come together and you'll have an understanding of it. Second Kings... Uh, chapter 4, verse 32 through 35. That's where I'm going to start, and then we're going to go through a number of scriptures. 2 Kings 4, 32, 35. When Elijah came into the house, he saw the child lying on his bed. Remember, last week the, ba the, the boy died. Um, it, it, the, the, uh, the Shunammite woman took him, laid him up on the bed of the prophet. We talked about taking our need, taking those broken things, laying them into the bed of presence. And, and so, and then she went, got the prophet, and he came. So Elijah comes into the house, saw the child lying on the bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Verse 34, then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hand on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again, walked once back and forth in the house, and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. As I started thinking about this concept of glory, I realized that, that the glory, the term kabod in the Old Testament for glory means weight, the weightiness or heaviness. In fact, it's translated, in, in literally, it's translated the heaviness 
of God. It refers to honor. It refers to glory. It refers to the strength being revealed. And as I thought about that text from Hector, I was thinking that, the, that Elijah places his full body weight on this dead child. And then I thought how much God wants to place his body weight, his glory upon the people of God and raise us up to these last days. He wants to place, he wants face-to-face encounter with his glory. That he would, that his heaviness, his weight would be, be placed upon us. That we would feel the weight of God. Now we're talking about, again, and we've been thinking a lot about the foundation and the weight of glory. So I, I want you just to follow the thoughts that I've been having in the Spirit. So I've been ro- so in the night I rolled over in the night and 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 I as I roll over these verses would just go through my mind things that I've had memorized things that I had known little catch phrases from the scripture so this week because I hadn't slept as good as I normally I'm going to tell you normally this is how I sleep I close my eyes and pff, it's time to get up don't remember a single thing I know a lot of people envy that but that's just the way it is I just close my eyes and just wake up I'm like a battery on charge and I'm, I'm charged. Last night was like that. Thank you, Lord. As I rolled over, though, Hosea 3.5 would go through my head. Hosea 3.5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord. And this is what, what, kept, this is what went through my mind. They shall come to his goodness in the latter days. They shall come to my... I kept hearing the Lord say, I roll over and I feel the Lord say, they'll come to my goodness in the latter days. They're coming to my goodness. Now this verse, the reason I know this verse is I was at a conference one time. Bill Johnson was was in the conference and they did a panel and they had questions from the audience. One of the questions was, what's it going to look like in the end times? And And so they turn and go, Bill, answer that one. Bill Johnson said, it's going to be good. <laughs> Hosea 3.5. That's all he said. That was his answer. It's going to be good. The Bible says, I, I always thought that it was going to be like apocalyptic. Everything was going to blow up. I was going to be like in line to get my head chopped off. Because I watched all those movies back in the 70s that scared the... Anyway... Scared, it scared any, anything. I mean, it just, I remember as a youth pastor, we would show the entire series on, on, on a, a weekend night. We would invite the kids, we'd have a sleep in at the church. And then you'd show all the end time movies um, uh, Thief in the Night, Distant Thunder, some of the, it was like three or four movies. And all of them are designed to scare you into the kingdom. And so you watch all of them, and by morning, every single kid was like, had prayed the sinner's prayer ten times through the night. Because they'll scare you to death. And because of that, I always had this fear of the end times. Will I be strong enough? Could I make it? Am I going to be able to? Could I, would I deny the Lord? In the, I mean, there's one of those movies. One of those movies start out with the end of the last movie. And the girl's about to get her head chopped off. And then she says, no, no, I don't. I deny Christ as the, as the, as the guillotine comes down and cuts her head off. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You're sick, man. <laughs> But yet this said, the Lord said to me, the Lord said, he he kept saying over and over, they'll come to my goodness in the last days. They'll come to my goodness in the last days. So then then the next night I was rolled over and and Psalm 27, I know the verse, verse 13, I, I, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see, I roll over and I hear, I'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I hear that proclaimed, it be on my thing. And I just roll over and say, God, you're so good. I, I, I declare that. And then, and then I kept hearing Psalm 63. I'm going to read a little bit more um, 
uh, be, because of, um, just because of the way the text is, but Psalm 63, 2 through 4, I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, and my lips shall praise you. I kept hearing thy loving kind, the way I memorized it when I was a kid. We used to sing the praise songs, right? Yeah. Thy loving kindness is better than life. That's what was going through my mind. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thy loving kindness. And there it was again. Your your goodness, your kindness. I kept hearing it over and over and over, and I said, Lord, what are you wanting to say to me? What are you saying? And this is what the Lord said to me. I, I said, I said I, I'm going to tell you, I hear the Lord saying, and I want to release this over this place, over you. I hear the Lord saying, my glory is my goodness. My glory is my goodness. You see, my mind's concept is the glory of the Lord is His weightiness. It's when, when He comes out as the heavyweight champion of the world and He bears His holy arm and wipes out all those evildoers. He's coming in all of His glory to, to judge. He's going to cause the world to be recreated by fire. and He's coming in and judging. You see, in my mind, this is how I see God being glorified. But he said to me, my glory is in my goodness. My glory is in my goodness. And he immediately had me go to Exodus chapter 33. And that's where I want to take you as we build this thought. Exodus 33. Remember, Moses is on the mountain. He's in the presence of the Lord. And in the presence of the Lord, he begins to pray a prayer. It's a threefold prayer. The first part is, Lord, teach me your ways. I don't know how to go from here. I need you to teach me your ways. And, that, and God says, I, I, my presence will go with you. I'll teach you. And then Moses says, he builds off of that, and he says, then don't send me up from here if your presence doesn't go. I don't want to go in the promised land. I don't want anything. I don't want you can keep, I, You can keep the nice house with the, with the three camel garage. I don't want all that stuff that the promised land offers me. I'd rather stay in the desert with a bunch of rebels and have your presence than go in and get the promises unless you're present. Don't send me in unless your presence goes with me. And he prays this prayer, for what will distinguish me from any other people on the face of the earth unless your presence is with me? You see, this meeting is just another meeting. We might as well have a Rotary Club meeting if the presence of the Lord isn't here. And so many churches have been reduced to just information. They do so much without presence. So, so he prays that prayer, and then Moses goes a step further, and he says, in verse 33, verse 18, Moses prays, he says, Lord, please show me your glory. Show me your kabod, your heaviness, the weight of your glory. Show me that. Thank you, Lord. The, the, the idea of glory is someone or something that is heavy in weight, is heavy in wealth, is heavy in abundance, is heavy in importance and respect. That's the concept. That's the word, the word kabod. I just read that to you out of the, out of the lexicon. Something heavy in weight, wealth, abundance, importance, and respect. Let me see your glory, God. Let me see your glory. And it says here in the next verse, and he said, I will make... I will make all my, read it to me, goodness. You want to see my glory? I'm going to make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim my name before you. And, and the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Amen. So do you want to see my glory? I'm going to let my goodness, isn't it? Isn't that kind of funny? In a kind of a weird way. You want to see my glory, Moses? I'm going to have my goodness pass in front of you. And then Moses goes on in the story. It goes on in the story. He says, but you can't look at me. You can't look at my fullness or you'll die. So I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock where he's revealing his goodness. And let's just follow it through. I'm going to ask a question, a, a very pointed question. Hopefully you'll get this, okay? Who is the cleft of the rock? Very good. Okay, there's no tricks in this, okay? I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. 
I'm going to place you in my son Jesus, a type of Jesus, and I'm going to put my hand over you, and as my glory goes by you, I'm going to remove my hand, and you'll be able to see my backside or my after effects. You'll be able to see me passing by, but you can't look me in the face in the fullness of this. So the next chapter, it tells us, I'm not turning you there, in chapter 34 of Exodus, Moses gets put in the cleft of the rock, and there he is, and God removes his hand, and he sees the glory of God, but he hears a voice. And the voice is speaking out of the presence of God, and it says, the Lord, the Lord, slow to anger and abounding in love. The proclamation out of the presence of the Lord. Slow to anger and abounding in love. Who does not hold the sins of people against them, but forgives to the third, no, forgives to a thousand generations. Then it says, but does not hold the guilty unpunished, but holds the sins of the fathers to the third and to the fourth generation. Now, I heard a whole lot of teaching in all my life in the church about how the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. But I haven't heard a whole lot of teaching of the goodness of God to a thousand generations. I heard a whole lot of people telling me that, man, you got to deal with this because you're carrying the sins of your grandfather. Go back and shut all them doors. And I'm not opposed to it. I believe it. I believe we need deliverance. Some of us in this very room here today need to be delivered from the sins of our fathers, our grandfathers, and their great-grandfathers. Some of you are carrying stuff. you got critters. <laughs> it's just true. You wonder why in the world you keep going down the same road? Well, deal with your critters. Some of you just ain't traveling alone. <laughs> I, I, I've seen some of them. Wonder why you can't overcome certain things, why you go down so long, three years, and then fall down, follow the pattern and go. Deal with the things. Deal with them already. There's people that can help you. People walk you with this. Deal with those things. We've got to go through that stuff. But I know this, that the glory of the Lord and his goodness outweighs all the things that we have empowered in our life. In comparison, a thousand generations to three or four generations. And we've given so much weight because the religious world loves to give weight to the problem and not to the answer. But God is, in these days, what he's saying is, I'm going to raise up a people that know and understand my glory, and my glory is seen in my goodness. So, man, I was just chewing on this. I want to look at a couple words here in this text that I just read. Verse 19 particularly. Just put verse 19 up there again. I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim my name to you, uh, before you, my name, the Lord. And I will grace, be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Keep that up there for a second. I want to talk about a couple words. The word goodness, okay? The word goodness in the Hebrew, okay, is, is a picture. The Hebrew words, are, the Hebrew letters usually are pictures and they, they call them pictographs. Of, of what the word, the, the meaning, the root meaning of the word is. In the Hebrew word goodness, it's a picture of a basket, okay? Used or, it's, it's used to contain or surround something. And then the second part of the word is a tent or a house. Combined, these, the, these mean to surround the house. God, the word goodness is that God says, I want to surround your house. Now take the prayer of Moses in context. Lord, don't let your presence be taken from me. Don't let me go without your presence. And he says, I will be with you wherever you go. I am going to surround your house with myself. See, that's the goodness of God. 
that he surrounds our house with himself. You see, so often I think we think that God, that God is like for us for a little while, but then he's going to go against us. So we live always waiting for him to pull or withdraw from us the blessing. Rather than seeing ourselves as surrounded by him, and that God's design for our life is that he would surround our lives, our, our homes, our families, surround our lives with his presence. I remember I had a friend years ago, he was preaching in the inner city, and he couldn't get the young kids to respond, so he would tell them stuff like, how many of you am I going to have to bury before you get used to me, before you hear the word? Because they were living lives that were going to be, they were headed towards death. And then how many times have we, have we preached God being, rather than a good father, we preached him being the Godfather. Like, you, you better be careful because you might wake up, you might find yourself in a cement overcoat thrown out in the river. God will come after you. I mean, don't we? You don't tithe, God will get it out of somehow, get it out of you from medical bills. Right? And it's all fear-based. There's a great, I, I wish I knew the name of the book. I always refer to the chapter in it, but um, the book is about, the book is a, an easy way to understand biblical interpretation, which is called um, hermeneutics. All right? So this is, hermeneutics, when you hear that word, you just want to go, <laughs> hermeneutics. <laughs> But, but hermeneutics is, is good biblical interpretation, and this book was about that. And one of the chapters in this book was called God Killed My Grandmother. And it was on, it was on misinformation that we think that the way that God gets our attention. You ever hear someone testify, man, last year my grandmother got sick and died, and God had to get used it to get my attention. Like, like God had to kill your grandmother to get your attention. And it's erroneous thinking towards the way God works. God can get your attention without killing grandma. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Every grandma saying amen. Woo! So the picture of goodness, we have to have an understanding that God is good. And the picture is, whenever you hear God is good, the picture is that God has put you like in a basket and has surrounded you with his goodness, with his presence, with his protection, with his life, with his hope, with everything that he is. He surrounded you, okay? That's the picture you, got, you have to have if you're going to understand goodness. Now let's look at the rest of those words. It says here, I will make my goodness pass before you, and then what will I also do? I will proclaim my name, Yahweh. The word proclaim, okay, is the idea of calling men together. The idea is proclaim, is not just get standing on the corner and just shouting out. It's calling an assembly and then announcing something. So he says this, I'm going to let my goodness pass in front of you, okay, I'm going to cause, and I'm going to call the assembly, I'm going to call in the spirit, I'm going to call in the, the spiritual beings, I'm going to call and gather around, and I'm going to proclaim, I'm going to speak something over you, and what I'm going to speak is my name, I'm going to put my name on top of you. But it's interesting. <laughs> the word name in Hebrew is derivative, is, is part of the same Hebrew word we get the word breath from. It means a man's character. So it's not just I'm going to say my name over you, but I'm going to release my character over you because the name of someone in God, whenever we use the name of, like today we use the name of Jesus, salvation, right? 
the names of God all reveal the character of God. That's why you can't argue that healing is not for today in the New Testament. Because his name in the Old Testament is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. So his name, healer, is his name, and his name reveals his character, and his character is re- it reveals his character, his nature, and it refers the way, the way he works with people. So we understand that we say, well, healing isn't for today. They only need it in the New Testament to get this, the church started and all that stuff. I mean, all these erroneous, lo- it really is, it's crazy doctrines, and t- but there's a lot of people that teach unbelief this way. The name, if his name is healer, then he's a continuous healer at all times. So whatever his name is revealed, so he says, I'm going to proclaim my name over you. In fact, I'm going to place my name on you. You see, I'm going to let my goodness come over you, Moses, and then I'm going to place my name over you. Who I am, my character and my nature is going to be placed over top of you. And my name is Yahweh, that I am, that I, I am, that I am. I am, I am, I was, I am, I ever will be, I am. I'm always in the now, I'm always in the here, I am. The word uh, Yahweh ultimately, make, some believe it believes full-breasted one or being able to nourish, to be able to give, being able to nurture and take care of. Uh, the idea is that God is always in the now, always here with us and always able. So he says that over him. So I'm going to read my name, my name, the Lord. And then he says, remember, he's talking about showing his glory. I'm going to, I will be gracious to the ones I choose to be gracious to, and I'll show mercy to the ones I choose to be merciful to. Two more great pictures in the Hebrew. The word gracious, the idea is beauty. Some translations say, I'll show you my beauty or my graciousness, because the, the Hebrew means beauty. Again, it's a, the picture is a wall. The idea is this, okay? This is what the word means, okay? Back then, they, cla- car- they traveled as nomads, and they traveled in clans. And so a clan may have many families in them. So when they would spend the night or they would set up camp for a period of time, they would build their tents up in a circle. And that circle would become, become a place of protection. It would be the place that the families could interact inside that circle. The kids could play. It was a safe place. There wasn't, just, there wasn't wild animals, venomous snakes, and all the things that could be in the desert. But it wasn't also the, the evil hordes or robbers. It was completely protected because they had a full circle. And in order to get in that circle, you had to pass through the security that of, the, of the outer tents that were placed around it. That's the picture of God's graciousness, and that's the idea of graciousness, that I'm not only going to be gracious to you, but I'm bringing you into the clan, and I'm letting you be free completely in that inner circle. You don't have any fear of the outside because I put a wall of protection about you. So he says, I will pass my goodness before you and I proclaim you, I name the Lord and I'm going to put this wall about you and I'm going to be gracious to you and then the last part is the mercy. And this literally comes out of the idea of compassion, the bowels as we understand them and it means to show extreme pity and love. And Jesus himself in the New Testament said he was moved with compassion. It meant he was moved, he was hit in the gut. It comes out of the inner being. But God is saying this, it's out of my inner being, not not Roger's, Yahweh. Yahweh's saying, out of Yahweh's inner being, out of my inner being, I'm going to show you mercy. I am going to move, my bowels are moved for you. I'm not talking about that way. I'm moved by my inner being. You see, because the Hebrews believed that the bowels were the center of, the, of, their, of their bodies. It was the out of the most innermost being. And so what he's saying is, out of the center of me, 
I'm going to show you my mercy. You see, everything about the glory of the Lord, the reason I broke that down is I want you to have an understanding that when Moses says, show me your glory, it wasn't that the rocks broke. It wasn't that, that God went, suddenly angels just were dispatched and wiped out the entire, uh, all the ites so they could get into the promised land without an altercation. None of that stuff happened. It was, I'm going to show you my goodness. Because it's out of this relationship from father to son. It's out of this relationship of, of, of man understanding the goodness of God that I'm going to release my kingdom through you. I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to show you my... I'm going to do the things I promised you. I'm going to see you all the way through, through, through life, through death, through resurrection, through your eternity. And it's all about you understanding my goodness. See, if we don't understand the goodness of God, then we'll misunderstand everything we interpret, the way he works and everything that happens in our life. Because there's some of us that got angry with God because he didn't answer prayer the way we told him he should. There's some of us that had it all figured out, and then when we gave God advice, he didn't take it, and we got mad. And there's some that, that don't darken the door of a church anymore. What they did is they took their ball and went home. That's the way God's going to be. Why? Because they misunderstood the goodness of God. Oftentimes we look and say, God says, I want that in your life. And we say, no, no, I like it too much. But I want that. No, I like it too much. And we go in this wrestling match. Why can't we lay it down? Because we don't understand the goodness of God. We'd rather hold on to what we have as faulty. We'd rather hold on to the familiar than to let go and let him be good to us, to show that he has so much more for us. I, I, I remember listening to Graham Cook um, one time. He was talking about his son um, when his sons were little, and they were trying to get his son to uh, give to the toys. He went in the room, they looked around, and he said, we're going to take some of our old toys and we're going to give them to kids that don't have any toys. And his son said, I'm not giving any of my toys. So, 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 whatever, it was not that long after that, Graham went in to tuck his son in and pray with him before bed, and he went in and sat down, and he had a sad face on his face, you know, sad face. He sat down on the bed, and he looked sad, and his son said, what's the matter, Dad? He said, I'm pretty sad. He said, why? He said, because I was looking at your toys on your shelf, and I was thinking of all the things I wanted to get you but there's no room for them because you have all, already have them filled with all the old toys. And he prayed with his son, went to bed. He said the morning they woke up to thump, 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 went outside. Their, their boy had taken all the stuff, put it in a box, and was dragging it down the steps. He's going, Daddy, I cleared my room. I want to give all this to the poor. We hold on to stuff when God wants so much better for us. Amen. We hold on to these things, and, we, and God says, no, no, I wanna, I'll give you upgrade. But no, 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 I like this. I want to hold on to this. It doesn't work anymore, but I still like it. Because we misunderstand the goodness of God. We got to have an understanding of the goodness of God. I'm going to take you. It's my loving kindness that's better than life. I'm going to take you to the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You're going to see the goodness of the Lord. I'm going to show my goodness in the last days. I want to show you my goodness. Now let's move to the New Testament. I want to take you to uh, 186 verses, and then we'll go. Okay. Real quickly, follow me. I'm going to take you through a pattern of verses. Most of them will be up here. I know it makes it a lot easier to the big Bible on the sky, but John 1, 14. John 1, 14, and then verse 16. John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, look, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen what? Glory. glory. And what's that glory revealed? He's full of glory and it's manifested to us as grace and truth. 
as grace and truth. His glory isn't manifested to us by Him slaying the wicked in that way. There will be wrath because people, judgment comes when God withdraws His presence and people get what they, they, they've chosen. If you have a fist up at God today, you decide, I do not want you to touch this area of my life. Guess what? You'll get what you deserve. You'll get him to withdraw because he'll say, if you don't want me to touch it, then have at it. You, be God, you want to be God on your own? Then have at it. It's been a scary time a few times in my life when God said that to me. All of a sudden I realized that I was in serious trouble unless I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So he says, so he shows his glory full of grace and truth. And then verse 16, verse 16 for from his fullness, there's the glory, we have all received what? Grace. grace upon grace. There it is. It's the glory of the Lord is revealed in his kindness, his goodness. He reveals his glory through his goodness. Out of his fullness, we've received grace upon grace. Okay, um, Titus, no, no, Acts 10.38. We don't need to turn there. I just want to throw this in there. It says, Jesus... Acts 10 38, Jesus went about doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil, for the Lord was with him. Jesus went about doing good. They went back to the reflection. We look at his life. Peter is, is up there preaching, and he said, Let me tell you about this Jesus. His whole life he went about doing good. He revealed the face of the Father. He revealed the heart of the Father. And he only did what the Father did. He only said what the Father said. And he did good. He went about doing good. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. And when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, there it is again, but when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our God as our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us, um, uh, done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing, regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus our Lord." When the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, what was the result? He saved us, showed us mercy, He regenerated us, He renewed us by the Spirit, whom He poured out through us through His Son. Because the glory of the Lord is revealed through goodness. Romans 2, 4. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that, it, that God's kindness is what leads us to repentance? God's kindness. Every one of these words. I, I love to do word studies. I don't always throw them out to you because, because we're not all, you know, uh, some of us like that, some of us don't. Um, in the way of, of that, but the truth is these words that are being used here all mean, like this word kindness, if you look it up, it just means the goodness or kindness of an individual, that God's goodness is, is seen to us in our place of repentance. Now go with me to John 2, John 2, and we're going to close out on this story here, John 2, verse 7. Remember, this is the story where Jesus um, is, is at the wedding of Cana, and it's his first public miracle, and so they, they run out of wine, right? They run out of wine, so Jesus says to the servants, his mom says, now do this, you know, listen to him, and, and so he says to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they fill them up to the brim, next verse, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast, so they took it out. And look what the master says. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, he did not know where it was come through. His servants had drawn the water. The master of the feast calls the bridegroom, next verse, and says to him, everyone serves what? The good wine first, and then people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. There's that word again. You've kept the good until now. 
And then look at the next verse. This was the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. And what? Manifested what? His glory. And his disciples believed in him. He manifested his glory by providing the good wine. What was being said here? Well, let's, let's just take the, the picture. Okay, you have the old wine or the, let's just say we have the old covenant. Jesus has brought the new covenant. He's come to reveal a new covenant, a new way of salvation, a new way of life. He's come, he's, he's come to the people and he's saying that the old wine, the old wine had its purpose, but I'm going to give you a new wine and he saved the best for last. He saved the best for last. He took the goodness, the good wine, and served it last. God wants to show his goodness to you. He wants to reveal his goodness to you. God wants you to make this your prayer. Show me your glory, God. Show me your glory. And have a manifestation. I pray that you roll over in the night this week with, a, with an understanding, with a spirit of, of revelation and wisdom, a grace upon you that the heavens would open and you'd have an encounter with the Lord and understand the goodness of God. The goodness of God to you. The goodness of God being revealed over your life. That God is for you and not against you. Now you see, there's a danger. There's a lot of preachers that don't want to preach this. Because the danger of, it becomes this, this idea of, even grace sometimes becomes this idea that, that you can just go and do anything you want then because God is good. He's just going to take care of me, put a hedge about me. I'm in, the, I'm in the camp of the Lord. He's going to protect me and keep me and all those things, okay? And we have this, this, this false understanding of sometimes we, we, we can have a confidence in Him. But this is the promises for those who are in Christ. This is the promises. The covenant is that we are in Him. And so it's His goodness. Here's, here's the idea. That it's, it's the goodness of the Lord that draws us to Himself. You know what won my heart to Him? His goodness. If I only serve Him because I'm afraid if I don't of wrath, then I really am not going to have a relationship with Him. Who wants to get close to a God that if I mess up one time is going to whip me and beat me and kick me out? So he reveals his goodness to us because it's his goodness and kindness that changes my heart and draws me in. So what does the fear of the Lord look like then? Because if the fear, if, I, if God's saying I'm good to you, I want to be good, I want to be kind to you, I want to show you love, then what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord isn't that every single time I mess up, he leans over the balcony of heaven, hits me with a two by four, and, and if I smile too much, he says, wipe that smile off your face. This is, life has to be tough, son. Okay, that's, that's, not, that's not it. When I, when I was a kid growing up, if I only did what my dad wanted me to do because I was afraid I'd be in trouble, then I, would, I wouldn't have much relationship with him. Things could get done, but I would never draw close to him. But when I learned to love my dad, I could respond to him based on my love and, and, and be afraid of hurting his heart by letting him down. So that's really the, where the fear of the Lord comes in. If you know that God loves you so much, he, he sent his son, his son was whipped and beaten. I mean, how do we, he went about doing good. What was the greatest place of the glory of God revealed? It's on the cross. It shows the goodness of God because he was whipped and beaten in our place. He took your and my sin. And it was like he walked up to us, took the chains off of us, put it on himself and said, listen, take your cross, I'm going to carry it. And he died in my place. And then I say, thanks, but no thanks. Or that's real good. Whip him harder. No, I reach out and said, I want to love him. Spurgeon said it this way. Spurgeon used this analogy, see, now, analogy in his, his sermon. He, he, in one of his messages, he preached about a knife. He said, suppose your brother, your very close uh, blood brother was murdered 
by a knife and killed by someone. And after the police investigation is over and all those things and everything, you go to the police. Well, you imagine going to the police and saying, can I have the knife that killed my brother? And the police said, well, we have no need for it. We're just going to destroy it, so here you can have it. And you take that knife home and you polish it. You make it all nice. You set it up on a stand and you set it out in your living room. And when anybody comes over, you say, look at that. They go, where would you get that incredible knife? That is the knife that killed my brother. He said, not one of you would ever do that. And then he said this, sin is the knife that put Jesus on the cross. Why do we hold on to it and we cherish it and we polish it and we, we set it up like it's some power, this wonderful thing in our life? You see, the goodness of God causes me to begin then to hate what he hates and love what he loves. See, God is so good to us. God is so gracious to us. If you're in Christ today, you, have no, you don't have to worry about sin. You don't have to worry about him ever throwing it up in your face. He took your sin as far as the east is from the west. He loves you. He cares for you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to guide you. He's placed you in a family clan. He's put the tent around you. He's put that basket around you of his goodness and said, I'm going to protect you. He put his name on you. And he says, this is mine. And he'll keep you forever. And we have to push that away and say thanks but no thanks to step out into a life of sin, into the stuff that we can get tangled up in. But if we do, and we, met, we, we quickly have to run back because we see there's such a contrast. Because the fear of the Lord is then, I don't want to hurt my God by sinning against him. I've used this illustration years of back a ways, but it's been a little while. But years ago, Kelsey, can I use you in a story? Thank you. I, I might have done it anyway, but I... <laughs> when Kelsey came home, when she came home and she was pregnant with Noelani, she was afraid to tell Angel and I. And um, it was a day or two after we were... Uh, no, no, this... We, we walked through all that, and then... It was a time Kelsey came to me and said, I don't understand the fear of the Lord. Can you explain it to me? And I, I said to her, I go, you remember when you came home and you told me that you were pregnant and everything? Were you afraid that we were going to kick you out of the house, throw you out and all this stuff? She said, not at all. I said, then why were you afraid to tell us? And she said this, I was afraid that I hurt you, your heart so much. I said, that's the fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord. We don't want to hurt daddy's heart. We don't want to hurt daddy's heart. We let him down. We don't want to hurt his heart. Why? Because of his goodness. Because of his goodness. For his goodness is his glory. So Lord, show us your glory in this room. Show us your glory. God, open the heavens and let us have an encounter with the glory of the Lord. Show us what your goodness looks like, God. Show us your glory. I pray, Lord God, for a, Lord, just a, a revealing. Pull the, pull, give us fresh revelation of the glory of the Lord. And let us encounter your goodness, God. Cause your goodness to pass in front of us. There's some here, Lord, with erroneous thinking. There's some here, Lord, that, that misunderstand you. There's some here, Lord, that, that um, they're afraid, whatever, to let go of it all. I ask for just a glimpse of your goodness, a glimpse of your goodness. For it's, Lord, in these last days, you're bringing us into the goodness of the Lord. The goodness of the Lord. We will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You've saved the best for last. You've saved the best for last. You've saved the best for last. 
We're just going to take a minute and respond to this. But there's something in Genesis 1 that I just want to close out with. When God created each day, at the end of each day, he said, it is evening, it was evening, and it was morning. It was the first day. It was evening, and it was morning, and it was the second day. That's how it ends, each day. It was evening and morning. I want to propose to you that the Jewish Sabbath or Jewish day begins at sundown or starts with darkness and ends in the light. If that's the truth, then let's look at the world around us. Is God going to end the world in darkness or end the world in light? How about your life? You didn't start off with you just an innocent little baby cooing and everything, and then you made all those bad choices, and now you're, now you, all God does is want to whip you because you're a mess. No, no, no. He said, I want to end your days in light. I want the best to be ahead of you, not behind you. Because it was evening and morning in the last day. And I want to speak that over you today as we close out. That you might have been an evening, but it's time for your morning. It's time for your resurrection. It's time for the light to shine on you. It's time for the glory of the Lord to be risen upon you. <laughs> what? Isaiah 60? The glory of the Lord rise upon you. How about if we change that to the goodness of the Lord rise upon you? The goodness of the Lord. It's time. Some of you are saying, well, you know what, I just, I just want to, I just messed up. I'm just too much of a mess. I just can't. No, 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 no. It was evening and then it's morning and it was the last day. God doesn't end the day, his creation, by nighttime. It doesn't end in the dark. It ends in the light. It ends with resurrection. And I believe that's true of us individually. I also believe that's true of what God's doing on the earth today. So stand with me. And let's enter into that. Let's enter into that. And if you're here and you're feeling like you're in that darkness, that God's, that day of just, of not knowing the goodness of God, and you're in this place where you feel like that, I don't know, maybe it's nighttime in your life right now. You're feeling like it's night. I want to invite you to the altar. I'm going to invite you to come over here because I want to declare over you the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And if you're feeling like it's nighttime for you, whether it's sin, bad choices, circumstances, you feel victimized, you feel the pain of the darkness, know this. The dawn has come. The dawn has come. The day is rising up on you. And the Son of Righteousness is rising with healing in His wings. And He's bringing you out of that darkness. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you just to come and stand here. And just, and just say, you know what? I need, I need the light to resurrect in my life. I'm coming into that place. Let's just, if you, if you feel in the Lord stirring you, I invite you to come and let's just, um, we're going to just sing. Let's just go ahead and let's just begin. That's right, just come if you're feeling. It's time for resurrection. It's time for a new day, a new day, a new day, a new day, a new day. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so Maybe there's another. Maybe there's someone else that just needs to come. Don't hesitate. Just come and stand. We're going to pray for you in a minute, but it's time for your resurrection. It's time for you to understand the goodness of the Lord. The goodness of the Lord. That's right. Bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I need the ministry team to quickly come. I want to pray with these that are here.
stepping up into it. The goodness of the Lord. The best is yet to come. I declare it. I declare the best is yet to come. 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 With every breath that I am Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Woo. Thank you, Lord. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. All my life you have Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The best is yet to come. Thank you, Lord. The goodness of the Lord. I release it over you. Thank you, Lord. Just release the goodness of the Lord. Release it. Thank you, Lord. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Just declare it. Yes. Oh, the best is yet to come. Be engulfed with his goodness. Be engulfed with his goodness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Oh, yes. Oh, Harry, the best is yet to come.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we will sing of your goodness, oh God. What I want to do is I want us to sing the bridge of that song in celebration as we close out today. Your goodness is coming after. It's coming after me. It's chasing us down. You can't get away from the goodness of God. I pray it hunts you down. If you go in dark places, it just pursues you. It takes over you. It pursues you until you are free, until you are victorious. And I want us to celebrate the fact that God is chasing us with the intent of overtaking us with his goodness. Let's just celebrate that. Your goodness is running. It's running after me. Thank you, Lord. Come on, celebrate it. After, it's running after me. Oh, yes. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Come on. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Oh, yeah, yeah. of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father.
what the Lord wanted me to, to say earlier, something that, that I saw. About 2009, I was in South Korea, and there was a what they call the bullet bullet train, super fast. And that train came to my my mind's eye. And the train in the front it had a G, a G, and God said that was the glory. This was before. Roger shared the word, and that the tracks, the tracks of the train were goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy, and the ticket that you, you needed to get on, on that plane, on that train, was faith. So God right now is saying, get on the train, get on the train, get on the train. It's a fast train. We're going to be moving faster and faster and faster. An acceleration as never before in our lives. An acceleration. Receive acceleration. Receive acceleration. Some of you that are here, that acceleration, acceleration of the goodness and the mercy and the kindness love, all that, that what uh, Kim shared, all of that is an acceleration, it's an, a penetration into your heart, a penetration into your soul, a healing of your body, a freeing of your soul, a firing up of the, the gift of God that is in you, to each one of you, as you say, yes, yes, I believe you, I believe you, and it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what you haven't done, today, the train is here, the train of glory, to get in, step in, the gate's open, the gate's open, step in, step in, the train of glory. Thank you, Father, thank you, Father, for every good and perfect gift that comes down from you, the Father of lights in whom there is no variation. Lord, it is for all of us that come believing, that come believing you and come in faith, the faith that you've given each one of us, the kindness that has brought us to repentance and is continuing to, to come into us, those even now, some of you that haven't repented. <laughs> you may, you may, you may. And now, it doesn't matter if today is your first day, be your first day and it could be forever life abundant and life eternal is ours receive it and walk in it the train is leaving there will be other trains doesn't mean it's the last one but why wait why wait We got that bullet train being built even as we speak. So it's coming up from Miami to Orlando. They're building it all the way up on 528. You come on all there. It's all being built now. Amen. Let's be carriers of that goodness. Let's extend the goodness of the Lord everywhere we go. Let's live under it. Then let's let's extend that goodness out and be kind. It's one of the fruit of the spirit, you know, that kindness, not meanness. Some people think when they get really filled with the Holy Ghost, it turns us mean, uh, or we act like it does anyway. But uh, but it's kindness, it's goodness. Let's be carriers of that. Amen. Well, bless you. Find somebody you haven't said hello to yet, and hug their neck and shake their hand and bless them. Now let's go back into our masked world and whatever. <laughs>